the current situation um, current situation in Sri Lanka. Uh, as you know, Sri Lanka has been going through um, a massive financial crisis that led to protests and uh, the resignation of the president and prime minister. So uh, the panelists today will um, give us uh, an overview of the situation uh, that led to uh, the present situation and then uh, perhaps offer some um, thoughts about where we go from here as well. Um, so I will quickly introduce um, the panelists um, and what they will be talking about. Um, I won't be introducing each one um, um, at the end of each month's uh, presentations. Um, and I would also like to thank the sponsors today, the Center for South Asia, the Global Legal Studies Center and uh, the Human Rights Program. So our first speaker today is Professor Arjuna Parakrama, who is a professor of English at the University of Paradenia in Sri Lanka. Um, he will be setting the context for uh, the current situation and looking at aspects of democracy and people's participation. Um, professor Shanti Senthi um, is, um, I have lots of different pieces of paper, um, is um, an assistant professor at Windsor Law School in Canada. She teaches business association, secure transactions and sports law. Uh, and she's going to talk about the central bank's role uh, in political mismanagement and fiscal instability. So she'll be looking at the financial aspects um, third speaker is Professor Vasuki Nesaya, um, who uh, teaches international human rights law, uh, legal and social theory at NYU um, Gallatin in the US, uh, and she's originally from Sri Lanka. Um, she's looking at minority rights and human rights aspects. Um, our fourth speaker is uh, Professor Madhuranga Kalugampitiya. Uh, who is a senior lecturer in English and the head of department of um, English at University of Paradenia in Sri Lanka. His teaching and research is in the area of language and discourse studies. He will be talking about the Aragalea, which is the struggle translated um, directly It's the struggle. So he will be talking about um, the peaceful protests. Uh, and our final speaker is Dr. Harini um, Amrasuria, who is um, a, a member of parliament. Sorry, I seem to have lost your, um, <laughs> the piece of paper about your bio. Um, and she will be talking about the Aragalea from the perspective of an opposition political party. So each speaker will speak for about 12 minutes, and then uh, we will have um, time for the Q&A. So um, with that, I invite Professor Arjuna Parakrama to um, make his remarks. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Kumudu uh, and the organizers. Uh, good evening, morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. I must apologize beforehand, I'm not feeling quite well, so I may be even less coherent than I am normally. I'm going to speak very briefly to what has been sort of called the setting of the context, aspects related to democracy and people's participation. First, to check, can you hear me clearly? Yes, we can. Okay, right, thank you. Right, so basically, I would suggest that there are four interlocking and but uh, I think also distinct kinds of crises that we're going through at the moment. The economic crisis, which I think is privileged in certain areas, the political crisis, which many would think uh, either derives from the economic or is causally related to it, the social crisis and the ideological crisis. Now, uh, I'd say most of the focus in the sort of global discussions would be the economic crisis. The political one is, I think, the most fraught in terms of what goes on in country, uh, at least in sort of intellectual circles. 
hardly anything is talked about the ideological and the social, and that's I think that's part of the the challenge that we have when we discuss how uh, we have to analyze this. I mean, I would say if I were to give one brief sort of one-liner description of where we are now, we have actually snatched defeat from the jaws of victory. And I think, uh, let me try to flesh that out a bit. So basically, in terms of the context we've had for the longest time, patron-client politics uh, seen as governance. We've had crony capitalism quite entrenched that we don't really know anything other than that. We have, again, all these are not very different and they may be cliches at one level, but I think we need to write them. We have neo-colonialism uh, presented as post-coloniality. And we have, with apologies to uh, Harini, we have politicians emerging as a wannabe class. So, uh, I mean, in terms of this kind of understanding of class quite loosely, so the, the self-interest of the class or the wannabe class predominates. So opposition, oppositionality, uh, exchanges, you know, attacks and so on, all placed within the perpetuation of that particular class, its class interest, is the way, loosely speaking. So, and that wannabe class is presented within a singular Buddhist state, which is marked by majoritarian triumphalism still um, 14 years after the uh, end of the war through uh, horrendous uh, attacks on civilian populations. Then, not only is that uh, majority in tribalism, but that takes the form of criminalizing first Tamil and now Muslims. So it's interesting, and in each case, when the Tamils were criminalized, then the Muslims became the, the quote, ideal minority. Now, and both terms are important. And now, of course, the Tamils are considered to be the, uh, the better minority than the Muslims. And of course, right through the Malay Tamil community has always been the unspeakable, unspoken, and sort of the subordinated to that. So we have competing nationalisms and identity politics on all sides. Within all of this, we have a discourse now, which I think is crucial for us to understand uh, both the notion of democracy and participation, when we have a kind of uncontested bedrock valorization of stability, unity, security, which is what I call the ideological trap. So all of this then tends to legitimize militarization, and we can see that on the street now, um, and the impunity, trash in human rights, the old, uh, so the old trap of saying we are faced by all kinds of uh, attacks from abroad, you know, the Western kind of stuff, the American and anti-American and Indian kind of stuff, uh, where which says all patriots and unite, you know, that, that whole kind of story. So uh, human rights becomes Western, all of that stuff is built in, and to some sense, even built in in the other kind of built in, but of course, that moves slightly further. I think we need to talk about that. So it's within that context, that you have what I call Vikrama Singh's Rajapaksa government. Now, in Sri Lanka, we're very fond of talking about Ranil Rajapaksa, you know, where the, the current president's first name is used with the last name of the dynasty that uh, ruled this country uh, until, uh, until uh, uh, Gautabi Rajapaksa was forced to resign. And even before, you know, there was a hiatus, but then before that, as well with his brother, mind, and that whole family of brothers and sons and nephews and all of that. Not many nieces or sisters, but anyway, so it's a male kind of thing. But I want to emphasize that it's Vikram Singh's Rajapaksa government because I think we're making a we're making a mistake when we think of 
Daniel Vikramasinghe as merely a puppet of the Rajapaksa. You see, I mean, he is a Rajapaksa proxy, but there is also two elements in his personal agenda which I think are crucial to understand both the nature of what's happening now and the kind of and the kind of uh, direction that we seem to be going. So on the one hand, it is clear that uh, he's there to protect the Rajapaksas and their cohorts, their group of, of uh, people who uh, come under that umbrella. It's, it's I mean, I, I, uh, I, I just said an aside because it's quite boring and obviously superficial. One of the words I think we contribute to the uh, English language is serendipity, as you know, serendipity, uh, a fortunate accident. And the other is, or there are many, of course, is family bandism. I don't know if you've come across that family bandism, which captures exactly what we have, a kind of nepotistic family based thing. So that Rajapaksa family bandist thing is being protected by Rajapaksa. But you have to add two other components. One is his driving agenda of personal revenge and his utter and complete faith in a particularly extreme form of neoliberalism, economic neoliberalism. So basically, what is the protection that he does? He's just a lapdog of the Rajapaksas on the one hand, but his value to parliament, to the 225, even the dissenters, is the promise of security, as I told you. So it is security, the three-pronged thing, the security from a justifiably enraged public, represented by the Aragali at that time, but in widely sort of, uh, the uh, protection from the public, protection for the corruption, or in, in you know, sort of protect them against prosecution of the corruption and other uh, acts of villainy and perfidy that they have committed, and protection from the necessity for an election, which should happen because there is absolutely no le legitimacy in the in the current uh, government, in the current parliament, all, all of them. So he's, he has to provide that the protection of all those three. So to prolong the parliament as long as possible, and maybe himself a little longer, and maybe work out some deals where he can, uh, he can do, I'll come to that later, but use the kind of Naomi Kleinian kind of shock doctrine sort of thing, or variations of it, to try to smuggle in not only economic stuff, but also political uh, so the point there is, so he has to provide that. Nobody likes Daniel Vikramasinghe, which is a different difference to the Rajapaksas and particularly uh, mind, of course. But Gotabe, there was a group of people that actually liked him, and he, because they shared in his ideology that majoritarianism, that thing in the Buddhist kind of stuff. Nobody liked. So Daniel Vikramasinghe is there only in so far as he can deliver this this business, and in order to deliver that. He has to repress dissent, he has to increase militarization, and he has to talk about stability, security, and constitution, etc., in the most outrageous kinds of way. So he protects the status quo and the family, brutally represses dissent, and so on, and leads to unbridled militarization, including of the private kind, paramilitary groups, extrajudicial methods, and so on, and then ensures stability and security. And then, of course, the IMF stuff, that whole shock doctrine stuff. So the IMF and all of these other deals will come in because the country is so desperate and so bank bankrupt and poor and all of that. But I want to say, so no serious regime change, and that can be seen by the absolute mockery of parliament that keeps electing people and becomes a singer with only one seat, his own seat, as uh, you know, uh, a supposedly commanding majority in parliament with one seat and then becomes a president, all of which because he's he doesn't wield his own power. But let me focus this because I have very short time on the way in which he pursues a personal agenda. I know this is not very kosher or something to talk about the individualization of politics or of, of, of governance or, or repression. But Vikram Singh operates on that basis that he has personal vendettas, revenge against those who don't like it. And if you look at the way they have been targeting young students, uh, you know, individuals in the political framework, and the one common factor is 
he believes they've done him some wrong or that they have they have crossed him or they've insulted him or something like that and they are pursued with a vengeance even in the case of one or two pretty ridiculous politicians 15 years after the fact so he bears a grudge and that drives him and he's single-minded in that but i think most frightening there is aside from that is the neoliberal thing and i think that is where Klein has something to say, warts and all, about how this particular uh, this particular shock, this sort of absolute crisis, is now leading us, and leading them to justify and rationalize the sort of curtailment of things that we've stood by for the longest time, which is uh, um, which is. Uh, the, the welfare state, the Keynesian, if you will, welfare state, and particularly free education, free health, subsidized transportation, and that, that, that work. So now they are now beginning to see in, uh, education as an investment, uh, health as an investment. So you don't, if it's health as an investment, you don't invest in people who are sick like me, and you don't invest in, in the poor. And I think it's important to realize that this may sound romantic, but Sri Lanka still remains one of the few countries in the world where you can have a first generation student from, from extremely poor, not uh, completely subaltern, but poor background, who can become a doctor without owing a penny, without owing a cent. So they, they have entirely free education up to now, but that's been dismantled. So I think that's the danger where everything is going to be uh, subordinated to a state that removes all fetters for the market to rapaciously destroy everything in its wake. So I think that's the context we have. And in that context, when the immediate uh, sort of uh, markers of, of this destitution were the sort of huge queues of, for, for fuel, the gas stuff, and also the other supplies, that the middle class joined the protest in that because their argument was not merely that we shouldn't have these, but why should we in the middle classes and the and the upper middle and so on, why should we be wasting our time? Why we should be destroying our lives and so on. So once those, there's a semblance of removal of those, I think very fragile and so on. While that was, when that was removed, the middle class left the protest, I think good riddance in some way but then you when you're dealing with these in terms of numbers not in terms of their ideology not in terms of the impact not in terms of their role then it looks like the protest has failed that it has dissipated that it has gone from being thousands and hundreds of people hundreds of thousands of people to handfuls of people who are then targeted and what we are doing now is we are reacting and responding to the uh, Clamp down to the to the uh, the sort of destruction of, of human rights for the targeting of individuals and groups. So we are now reduced to responding to the violence and the violation of rights, as opposed to moving beyond to setting the agenda. So Vikram Singer's Rajapaksa government has now set the agenda. On the one hand, the shock stuff. So we're willing to accept anything from the IMF or any other kind of deal. And on the other hand, we are now reduced to going to courts and fighting for the release of people. He, he, he becomes his own agenda. The, the Prevention Tourism Act, I'm sure Vatican others will talk about it, is being invoked to, to keep some of the key protesters under lock, lock and key and, and without uh, any, any even semblance of democratic rights. I think I'll stop there and I hope to... Uh, discuss any of these issues that you would like to make. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arjuna. Thank you so much for that um, overview of uh, what's happening in the country today. Um, so um, next, our next speaker is uh, Professor Shanti Senti. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, just my apologies. Um, my Wi-Fi connection keeps saying uh, it's weak, so I may switch off my camera in the middle, in case so you can hear me. Because I think there's a, I, I have to choose either video or sound. I don't know. Um, so if you can't hear me, let me know. 
So um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I'm incredibly grateful to be here, to have the opportunity to talk to some of my fellow distinguished panelists who are in Sri Lanka, where my family's from. Um, and I'd like to take this opportunity to actually share some initial thoughts on my broader research, which is um, uh, financial inclusion in Sri Lanka. And in that same aspect, I did a lot of field work for three, four years with the central bank and banking policies and trying to develop or trying to think about the transplantation components within the financial structure uh, uh, that sort of legally have supported this, um, this fiscal operation. I'm also very cognizant that my work currently is uh, done by researchers and reporters on the ground. And I wanna thank them and I'm grateful for their help. And I would like to acknowledge their courage and their contribution uh, to my own knowledge um, build, building. So my presentation today explores the Central Bank of Sri Lanka's role in the most publicized and uh, economic fallout. As many of you know, and around the world, as the, fin as, the nation financial, as the nation's financial regulator, the central bank's monetary policy and operations are designed to ensure fiscal stability through prudential regulation. However, the images and sound bites of the pro protests in response to the Sri Lankan economic crisis illustrate a deep need to re-examine Sri Lanka's financial infrastructure. Historically, banking failures are generally followed by a political upheaval and social unrest. Yet Sri Lanka's dire straits are more pronounced due to its exigent, exigent circumstances that are underscored by the central bank's inability to manage the internal crisis that sort of preset the, the stage and the actual crisis without external intervention. And why is that? Why was the central bank not prepared for this? Did they know? I, I mean, there's different um, sort of perspectives and different uh, uh, opinions around this. Uh, as global stakeholders brace for a financial cont contagion, Sri Lanka's social and economic uh, fabric is further unraveling. And global financial stakeholders um, see Sri Lanka as the canary in the coal mine example, meaning global financial debt is problematic right now. We are, uh, many countries are, might follow this particular financial um, pathway. But again, it's unclear on, on what's being released and what, how we see um, specific debt reconstruction settlements in the next few months. Um, through an analysis of historical moments and current trends, I hope to provide a commentary on the challenges and responses to understand the CBL, CBSL's role in this Sri Lanka's catastrophic financial collapse. So this economic crisis has been believed to be the worst in seven decades, which has led to hyperinflation and commodity shortages. And um, again, some uh, commentators and some scholars believe that this is just the beginning of a larger global meltdown. Um, as many of my distinguished colleagues will possibly raise the sources of this crisis from different vantage points, um, which led to the mass protest, I will focus on the failure of the fiscal oversight by the CBSL in order to provide you with some of the various perspectives the role of the fiscal regulator, I would like to provide you a very short glimpse of the financial uh, um, bailout, the IMF bailout deal, which I sort of learned about in the, next, in the past week or so, and which will serve as an anchor to illustrate the problems that are sort of ruptured or, or will rupture or have ruptured, I guess, um, of the regulatory framework that has, you know, from since post-independence. So, um, so forgive me if this is incredibly boring, but I'm gonna to try to make it fun. The Sri Lankan government and the IMF uh, reached an intent uh, a tentative restructuring deal under the economic adjustment program with the IMF. So it should be completed by December. Right now it has a staff agreement, but it needs to be, uh, you know, get approved by the executive. So still there's like a three month lag until we actually know whether it's been fixed in stone. And I would like to flag some interesting elements um, of this and our conditions of this particular deal. First of all, 13 billion in international sovereign bonds will be restructured, restructured by the parties which are being held by private uh, creditors and as asset managers, BlackRock and Ashmore. These are American private equity funds 
they're not regulated by the IMF or the World Bank. They're regulated by the US financial regulator. So from a legal perspective, who has jurisdiction over their own operations and their own sort of responses or advice or restructuring components. So that's troubling to some extent um, from, a, from a theoretical perspective. And also the financial legal advisors employed by the state, uh, Lazard and Clifford Chance, again, foreign entities providing advice. Um, it, and I know that they're in partnership with local uh, and domestic um, um, officials, yet I find it interesting that we have this foreign intervention yet again. And as conditions are placed on Sri Lanka to renegotiate the debt with, a bilat with bilateral uh, creditors to obtain financing insurances uh, from China, Japan, and India, I would like to understand more on those, um, those agreements because yet again, those are not done under the purview of the IMF per se, they're done on a private bilateral basis. Uh, because Sri Lanka is a middle income country, so they're in a different category. Uh, and I, I can, ex uh, you know, we can talk about that in the Q&A later on. Um, so the funds will be distributed within four years to promote economic stability, fuel and, uh, and fuel economic growth. The package is supposedly going to help raise government re revenue, uh, introduce new pricing for fuel and electricity, hike social spending, and very importantly for my research, bolster central bank autonomy. So that to me is quite telling. So often economic and political turmoil is associated with banking sector for, uh, failures. We know this, but yet this, this appearance of the non-independence of the central bank has been central in my research. And I'm also interested in finding out more around the operations, the internal controls, and some of the constitutional issues that sort of surround this question. And what about the economic policies that actually affect the CBL's independence and, um, um, and, and its operations? How did the fiscal regulator, re regulator allow this type of financial fallout to occur? So I'm hoping to unravel some of the close linkages of the CBSL to political will. Uh, the CBSL is designed to operate in independently. However, it was used as a mere puppet to enable specific political policy approaches. The financial sector plays an incredibly crucial role in dispersing capital to competing interests and the failure of such, uh, of such demonstrated that the financial regulator and the banks um, are part of these significant repercussions um, and also contributed to political and social instability. So in order to understand these linkages, uh, we have to trace the historical establishment of the central bank to this contemporary moment to explore the post-colonial institutional design process. And again, looking back, uh, it's very um, difficult to find archival research. So I have tried in doing my PhD and then I kind of went to a different uh, space within the research to understand how the central bank was formed. And um, my broader research notes that the resistance towards colonial rule was also was demonstrated by the type of expertise that was sought to create this particular central bank post independence. So I'm just going to quickly quote from uh, from the archives. For advice on for advice on the establishment of a central bank, the government of Ceylon at the time preferred to go to the Federal Reserve System of the United States rather than the Bank of England. That's why all the format formative influences on Ceylon's monetary and banking institutions had been British. Her central bank, both in its powers and its structures, resembles those that have been recently set up on the basis of American advice in a number of underdeveloped countries. Again, due to the absence in literature, um, this is a painstaking process to figure out the other connections. Um, a narrative of monetary events and the analysis of the effects during that time period on the economic system is, is scarce. So again, I'm piecing together this. It took 11 years uh, until 1950, um, for the central bank to be, to, to be established. And 
It was created on the monetary law numbered 58 of 1949. And the central bank, thank you, Samudu. Uh, the central bank resu resulted after a one-man commission, which was obviously designed to emulate the Federal Reserve System. And again, during this time, the central bank appointed John Exeter as to be the first governor of the Sri Lankan bank, who is one of the American, who was a, a, a regulated in the American uh, federal system. So because of time uh, um, issues, I'm gonna just go to my, uh, to my um, conclusion. I think this is an opportunity to really understand how problematic the institutional structure is and uh, in the financial sector in Sri Lanka. I think this is an opportunity for us to re-examine or uh, reconfigure and restructure some of the institutional frameworks frameworks that uh, have created the financial archetype and the landscape by first starting to reconfigure internal controls and legislative um, interventions to create more of an independent institution um, in Sri Lanka. So I'm more than, again, um, I'm more than um, happy to talk about this in the Q&A and I don't want to take up more time. Thanks so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Shanti. Um, our next speaker is Vasuki, um, who will talk about minority rights and human rights aspects of the current situation. Great. Um, thanks for inviting me, Simudu, and um, also thank you, Sarah, and everyone else at the uh, Center for South Asia. Um, I'm really glad to be part of this conversation and to learn from my co-panelists um, all of whom are much better informed than I am, and I'm really speaking here without a license, as it were. Um, I think I've been asked to speak about the human rights issues at stake, and I think much of what I say will be familiar to all here, but perhaps it's useful nevertheless to sort of recap and sort of situate sort of the different directions of um, human rights advocacy. Um, the government, of course, has launched a concerted attack on both civil and political rights on the one hand and economic and social rights on the other. Um, and consider, for instance, the right to dissent and a plethora of associated rights, such as the right to free association, freedom of conscience, the right to free speech. Uh, the Rana Vikram Singh government has conducted a wave of arrests of student activists, of labor leaders, um, and other activists in the social movements associated with or contributing to Anagalia, uh, while also using tear gas, water cannons, and violence to disperse demonstration. Um, the state remains deeply majoritarian. Uh, many of the infringements on basic human rights that were previously used uh, to target Muslims and Tamils have now been repurposed and expanded to target all dissent. Uh, the Draconian Prevention of Terrorism Act uh, that Arjuna referenced earlier, uh, whose repeal has long been a demand advanced by human rights activists, has been used as the legal pretext for these arrests. Um, in the context of the war, the government designated um, vast swaths of land in the north and east as high security zones uh, that not only dispossessed local communities, but also brought heightened surveillance uh, and political and military control over those communities. Last week, the government used the Official Secrets Act to extend this approach to the suppression of dissent uh, in, in the south and declared vast swaths of Colombo high security zones. These new regulations have, the, uh, have given the police wide ranging authority to control and monitor public gatherings, to restrict and clamp down on protests and arrest and detain protesters. The protests were of course catalyzed by the government's failure to address its obligations to guarantee basic economic and social rights. Um, according to the World Food Program, 6.3 million Sri Lankans, almost a third of the country are now food insecure. And that may well be an underestimate of the scale of the crisis. Um, the right to food is of course a basic human rights and a whole host of government policies enacted by the Rajapaksa government undermine this basic right. Similarly, all the international lenders that facilitated the Rajapaksa government policy priorities are also, of course, complicit in these violations. In the current context, um, as the IMF loans and a new set of conditionalities are negotiated, uh, we also need to hold international actors responsible so that they too are in compliance with the promotion and safeguarding of economic and social rights. 
over the last uh, decades, there has been all over the world much work about the grave human rights consequences of the standard sort of neoliberal policy conditionalities that have sort of engendered and exacerbated sovereign debt crisis and their fallout for those most economically vulnerable. Um, some of the economic policy directions that the IMF has put on the table um, in the Sri Lanka negotiations, such as the removal of energy subsidies or the move to market pricing, uh, will have brutal impacts on the poor in ways that will jeopardize the right to food and, in fact, the right to life itself, perhaps. These human rights considerations should be internal to macroeconomic policymaking rather than external factor. The IMF has, of course, been resistant to this approach, and the human rights community needs to challenge the IMF's historic position that these issues go beyond their institutional mandate, including the distinctions that the IMF draws between being a monetary agency and a development agency, between issues that are technical and issues that are political. These are all sort of deeply political issues. I've tried to briefly summarize the human rights issues at stake in the current conjuncture. Uh, let me conclude by pointing to sort of three suggestions that emerge from this landscape for the human rights community, or three sort of priorities or directions um, for advocacy. Firstly, that the human rights community needs to focus on the interrelationship between civil and political rights and economic and social rights. So the right to food and the right to dissent are intertwined as starkly demonstrated um, in developments in Sri Lanka over the course of this year. The, within the human rights community, of course, there's much, um, much has often been said about how these are interdependent rights, but there's very little um, that, uh, that, but that doesn't often translate into the actual work of human rights organizations. Many human rights organizations still cling to a narrow focus on civil and political rights. For instance, Human Rights Watch has released several statements criticizing the government's suppression of dissent, and these are, of course, very welcome, and they treat the, but they treat the economic crisis as backdrop rather than central to the politics of dissent. And so there needs to also be a change, I think, in how the human rights uh, community approaches the interrelationship between these rights. Secondly, the human rights community needs to focus, I think, on the interrelationship between national policymaking and the policy apparatus of international institutions. Again, if you look, for instance, at statements released by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, they focused on the Sri Lankan government's human rights violations. And this, again, is welcome. But surely their responsible responsibilities should also extend to the IMF and the donor community and the international sort of neoliberal economic architecture that has engendered the sovereign debt crisis in Sri Lanka and elsewhere. You know, Sri Lanka, as um, uh, Shanti also mentioned, is just sort of the tip of the uh, of, of the scanner in the coal mine. You know, Lebanon, Russia, Suriname, Zambia, Pakistan, Argentina. There's a whole range of countries that have uh, who's uh, who, who are on the on the verge of sort of sovereign debt uh, implosion. Finally, there's much talk in the human rights community about the rule of law and the need to observe the rule of law ensure security and stability and stabilize the situation. Yet ideas of law, security, and stability have themselves been weaponized against the protesters. In other words, much of the international community's vocabulary of good governance has itself been aligned with the status quo. In contrast, there needs to be a much greater focus on accountability. International accountability, internationally, we need accountability of predatory lenders for their own complicity in odious debt. And nationally, we need accountability of the executive and legislative branches, accountability of the president and the parliamentarians who have sought to defeat the struggle for democracy on the street. Okay, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vasuki. You have five more minutes, actually. <laughs> um, all right. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Madhuranga Kalugampitiya, and he will talk um, more about the Aragali itself and what led to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sumudu. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Sumudu, and your team. Uh, and my apologies for all the technical difficulties that uh, I had, and you had to uh, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, finally, the electricity connection is back, so I, uh, I, I hope the connection is going to be stable. Uh, right. Uh, so, once again, thank you very much for this amazing opportunity. I really appreciate uh, thinking of me for this, uh, to talk about a topic like Aragalel, uh, which is very dear to me, very close to my heart. 
Um, yeah, so um, I've been asked to talk about Aragalea. Um, I relate to Aragalea, now we call the struggle Aragalea in Singhala, and I, I believe the, the Tamil word is Poratan. Um, I relate to this not only as a citizen of Sri Lanka, I relate to it also as a parent. And there are two, a parent of two daughters, which makes my, my position special at this uh, particular historical juncture in Sri Lankan history. And also as a teacher who works with students on a daily basis. Uh, and also as somebody coming from the middle to upper middle class social position. I do, the, the reason I mentioned that was I do have access to a fairly comfortable life in the Sri Lankan context. And I think that also shapes the way I relate to Aragalea. Now Aragalea has been, a, as I said before, Aragalea has been a very special um, experience for me over the past few months. Um, I don't intend to romanticize Aragalea, but a lot of things that I have to say about Aragalea uh, might end up doing that. So let's keep that in mind. Whatever I say need to be understood in the context of my subject positions, the positions that I just uh, mentioned. Uh, so as I'm sure many of, like, many of us who are familiar with Aragalea, we know what happened. Hundreds and thousands of people took to, street, took to the streets. Um, in April, the situation had been brewing for some time, but April was the climax. People decided, no, we've had enough. We need to do something about this. And hundreds and thousands of people took to the streets. Um, April uh, 9th was the big day. Uh, in Colombo, Goldface Green, um, people got together and started this protest demonstration. At the time it, uh, it started, of course, uh, I don't think a lot of people expected it to continue for a long time because in the Sri Lankan experience, what we, the kinds of protests that we had seen a few days, and then that's the end of that protest demonstration. But obviously this went on for more than uh, that short period of time. Um, it was there, it happened uh, for about three months continuously. So this was definitely a special experience, a very special experience in the Sri Lankan context. Um, and obviously, as has been said before, the main argument or the, the main slogan was uh, go home, go ta. The president of Sri Lanka had to step down. That was the demand of the protesters because they believed that the president and his team was responsible for what, for the economic collapse and all the other problems uh, that had emerged in the Sri Lankan context. So sending the president home was one of the key demands. And uh, gradually we could see pillars falling uh, on May 9th, the Prime Minister, Mahindra Rajapaksha, the former president, and who's the de facto sort of uh, leader of uh, Sri Lanka, uh, stepping down from the Prime Minister position. And then a month after that, the Minister of Finance, Basil Rajapaksha, one of the brothers in the family, he had to step down too. And then finally, uh, the president himself had to step down. Not only did he have to step down, he had to flee the country. So these were obviously victories, achievements of the Aragalia. Uh, people continuing to be on the streets and uh, 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 demanding this kind of political change. And uh, it was not only in the gold face green that where the Aragalia happened, the protest demonstrations happened across the country, different parts of the country. And the most beautiful part about this uh, Aragale demonstrations was that people came to the streets without being prompted by a political leader or a party or an organization. In each and every village, almost, uh, people came to the streets and started demonstrating. And it was a beautiful experience. People had the power. They decided what they wanted to do. They decided how they wanted to respond to the government. They decided how they wanted to show their anger at uh, what was happening in the country. So it was a truly people's move, a people's moment. And in the context of that, as I said before, all these pillars, the big, the big shots of the country, 
they had to step down they had no option but to step down and it was in that sense it was a truly uh, victorious moment for the people of sri lanka um, and in this aragare one of the one of the uh, noted aspects of the aragare was uh, it had a strong presence of the middle class and upper middle class uh, participation um, that was not really the case earlier in the sri lankan history in the sri lankan context protest demonstrations but but this time a lot of people representing that uh, social stratum came to the streets and joined the struggle uh, so in that sense a lot of people were there and the people whose voice really mattered and the government had no option but to take that into consideration um, was something that we saw on the streets so that was definitely a revolution because it led to unprecedented changes uh, for the first time in sri lankan history we saw a president an executive president stepping down from the throne uh, and the government lost its two thirds majority the government eventually lost its power obviously they found ways of coming back to power and so even now they are in power but in a different different mode different shape uh, but at that moment those people those key personalities in the government had no option but to uh, step down so that is definitely a victory definitely a revolution but i think a more important revolution happened uh, at a different level and i would like to call this an internal kind of revolution which happened in the minds in the heads in the in the thinking of a lot of people once again i'm not talking about everybody being part of like reflecting this kind of change uh, but a considerable number of people in society went through uh, a certain transformation um, and i think that is one of the biggest uh, victories of the aragale just to give you a couple of concrete examples events that happened in the context of aragale now the war came to an end in 2009 and since 2009 celebrating the lives lost in the final uh, phase of the war was not really an option in the sri lankan context particularly for the tamil speaking minority that was not an option the only people whom uh, you could celebrate were the war heroes the soldiers and the the, the top leadership from the government side uh, the administration that gave uh, leadership to the war but in the context of the aragale we find a space emerging where people could celebrate not only the war heroes those who wanted to celebrate war heroes they could do it without any problem but in general lives lost due to the war being celebrated um, um, during this period hmm? there were many events that happened and some of those events happened in colombo itself the capital city of sri lanka itself uh, which was amazing that space where people got together and they celebrated they commemorated the lives lost due to the war not only in colombo even in velumulli vaikal where the war came to an end people could get together and commemorate the lives lost due to the war hmm? so that was a major sort of de development and also in the context of the aragale we find the first major public pride parade in sri lanka taking place uh, so until this year we hadn't really heard about this idea of a uh, of a pride parade in the sri lankan context but in the context of the aragale we find a space being created where the lgbt com uh, iq community could come together and make a case for their rights and people became more and more aware of the fact that there were such people among us in the sri lankan context um so that was also thank you so much uh, a major sort of victory and we found we saw a lot of women being like participating in the aragale mothers with newborn babies coming to the aragale taking part in the aragale spending nights and nights Uh, at goldface green so women 
found uh, uh, like there was a very strong uh, presence of women in Aragale. And finally, I would like to say that we also saw a new cultural life being born in the context of Aragale. Just to give you one example uh, from Kandy, from where I am. Um, those who are familiar with Kandy know that there's this temple, very sacred temple of the tooth in Kandy. And because of that, you can't do all sorts of things. You're not supposed to do certain things in Kandy, which affected in a negative way, the sanctity of this space. But in the context of the Aragalaya, we found people crossing that bound, uh, doing all sorts of things in the context, in the, in the vicinity of the temple of the tool, which one would not really associate with the activities of the temple of the tool. Uh, and we also find people standing up more and more for their rights. Once again, just to give one tangible example, in the, from the university context, there's a lot of bullying happy, happening in the Sri Lankan university context, and it has been happening for a long time. We call it ragging. Uh, but in, after the Aragalaya, we find those who are being bullied standing up for their rights and making a case for their freedom. So all these things I see as uh, things that came out of the Aragalaya context, and I would like to conclude my remarks uh, with Karl Marx's very famous line, uh, which is, the revolution is dead, long live the re revolution. We still feel the effects of the revolution, and I'm sure that those are going to define what we are going to do in the next uh, like many years to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ranga, um, for those remarks about the Aragalaya and the aftermath and the consequences of the Aragalaya. Um, our final speaker is Dr. Harini Amrasuria. Um, uh, I'm afraid I uh, didn't uh, introduce you properly, so I'm taking a couple of minutes to do that. So um, she's a member of parliament representing the National People's Power, a left-wing coalition. Prior to entering parliament, she was a senior lecturer at the Open University of Sri Lanka. Thank you, um, Harini, over to you. Uh Thank you, Sumudu. Thank you for organizing this and including me in this panel. Um, so um, I think this um, this Aragale, the, what has been going on in Sri Lanka for the past several months, I would say, is uh, quite unique in a for our country, which has seen a lot of turmoil, which has seen a lot of uh, anti-government, anti-state. Uh, insurrections, uh, civil wars uh, in the past. I think what, what is particularly unique about the past several months and what has been happening recently is the, the, the fact, and um, Madhuranga referred to it, was that this was something that was not initiated or led by any one political party or, or a established political group but rather something that came about quite spontaneously. Um, in fact, I would even predate it to about a year ago when farmers started protesting against the very arbitrary decision by the former president uh, to sort of overnight declare that Sri Lanka was switching from, uh, was going to go into a fully organic uh, agriculture uh, uh, policy. So basically overnight banning all um, chemical fertilizers, insecticides, uh, et cetera, which were kind of uh, part and parcel, I mean, which was which are quite crucial to how agriculture has been practiced for years in this country. And, and although many uh, had agreed with the necessity to uh, reduce uh, the use of uh, chemicals, this sort of overnight ban, simply destroyed the livelihoods of thousands and thousands of, of farmers. So the first uh, signs of dissent against this government came from that farming community. This was followed by uh, school teachers who also took to the streets demanding higher salaries. So, so for, the, for about a year and a half, I would say there's been sort of consistent um, organizing by various affected communities who've been taking on 
the government and expressing their frustration at what has uh, obviously been really, uh, really uh, difficult uh, under very difficult circumstances. The, uh, the Aragale, what we now refer to as the Aragale, which was centered around the protest movement that uh, took place at Gall Face, uh, was unique for many reasons. And, I, and, I, and, and the, uh, my fellow panelists have referred to some of, uh, some of this. And in, in many ways, it didn't just challenge the government, it challenged political parties that have uh, usually been at the forefront of organizing protests and dissent and uh, taking the leadership in, in opposing, uh, op opposing uh, governments in power. For, for the first time, I, uh, I would say in, in Sri Lankan history, political parties had to take a back, back, uh, back seat. And, um, uh, and, and the Aragalia itself was very consciously what um, uh, how they referred to themselves as, as non-partisan. Um, in, uh, in the Sinhalese term, Admadranga, I hope I'm translating this correctly, was Nirpakshika. Nirpakshika is non-partisan, right? So very, very sort of self-consciously not aligned to one particular political party. And that was quite, quite a challenge uh, to uh, establish political parties, especially to... Um, to political parties in, in opposition and particularly political parties as the one I represented, which is which has usually been uh, in the forefront of many of these protests in, 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 uh, in earlier times. So in many ways, political parties also had to rethink and figure out how to link to the Aragale, what kind of support uh, to provide the Aragale while respecting the nonpartisan nature of uh, of of this movement, and um, particularly particularly, I would say after the 9th of May, when uh, uh, when the, the then government led uh, led by the former Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa unleashed a really brutal attack on the protesters on which had the uh, on the protesters at Gall Face. And that really exposed, in a way, the vulnerability of uh, protesters to this kind of attack. And that then, in a way, uh, demanded that established political parties and particularly opposition political parties also uh, take a more active role in, in, uh, in protecting that space and in speaking out on behalf of, uh, of the Aragalia. So I would say that post May 9th, uh, political parties also began to play a bigger role in, in, in how, um, uh, how the Aragale unfolded and in ensuring that that space was protected. Um, of course, the, the culmination of all of this was the, was the 9th of July, which was the day that the president fled the country. And here I would say that almost all political parties underestimated how momentous a day that was going to be. Uh, I don't think any of us expected the numbers that turned up on that day and the, and the energy with which people um, surrounded uh, the centers of power as it were, uh, and, the, and that any of us could have predicted that within 24 hours, Gotabe Rajapaksa, who had been elected with such a huge majority would actually have to flee the country. That, that was, and in a way, I think that the, the very fact that uh, we underestimated uh, how, how momentous that day was going to be also served as a huge lesson uh, for many of, many of us, in, especially uh, parties in the, uh, uh, in the left, uh, left, left of politics. So, uh, but unfortunately, post July 9th, there has also been a, what in traditionally we can refer to as a counter revolution uh, with, the, with the state sort of reasserting its power. Uh, and, and, I, and we think this is primarily due to the huge challenge uh, that has been posted to the political class, to the establishment 
and what the government fears the most perhaps is the is the fact that this was like this was a truly people led people led movement i think they are much more familiar with dealing with political opponents who are identifiable who are linked to a political party who are uh, who, who 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 are you know identified opponents but this kind of uh, dispersed per, per, uh, protest which was which didn't have any identified a uh, party or leader that they could really attack unnerved them and i think what we see now is that is the is 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 that attempt in a way to uh, to crush that spontaneity to crush that uh, to crush the the engagement of people from this uh, from the protest movement uh, which is why so uh, so even uh, we see many of the the the, the suppressive tactics that are being adopted, especially the arbitrary arrests, which often get sort of thrown out of court within 24 hours of the uh, uh, the person who's been arrested being presented to court, is 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 actually a kind of a mental game that the government is playing in order to uh, really kind of um, uh, scare people or harass people into not participating in this kind of uh, uh, protests in the future. Uh, so it's really sort of singling out people, uh, especially those, uh, and you hear less about the people who are being arrested or harassed who are not part of any political movement or party. Uh, those are the ones who are really vulnerable. And those are the ones that the government is also deliberately targeting so that uh, there's this sort of fear that, you know, if you step out of line, this is what is going to happen to you. Um, and, and I think, again, in a way, this has meant that political parties have had to step up and, and take on this issue in terms of defending uh, the, the, the democratic space that is being increasingly shrunk through these tactics and by the kind of fear tactics that the government is adopting at this time. So there are, so as a political party in parliament, admittedly um, uh, the minority, very much in the minority, there are huge challenges before us in, 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 the, uh, in parliament, which is still dominated by the ruling party, by the ruling government. So, uh, the, number, so the, the numbers that existed two years ago in parliament, giving this government a huge majority in parliament remain relatively unchanged that they don't, though they don't have the same uh, there there have been defectors from the from the party to uh, to the opposition thank you sumudu uh, they're still very much in control so there's also enormous pressure within parliament and also from the i would say the middle class and the liberal groups who participated in the aragalaya who've now as arjuna mentioned sort of defected in the in 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 the hope that Ranil is going to fix things, Ranil Vikram Singh is going to fix things. That there's also this huge pressure on politic on on the opposition um, to give Ranil Vikram Singh a chance to cooperate, uh, to engage with the government. And as far as we are concerned, our position has been consistently uh, that the Ranil Vikram Singh presidency and the reg the regime that is currently in power. Has lost his, it has no mandate to govern, is, is the illegitimate, and therefore our struggle now and our role both inside parliament and outside parliament is to call for uh, an election so that people can express their, their uh, can exercise their mandate in an election. Uh, because we feel that this the, the the mandate that this government had to rule that certainly the, uh, there is no mandate for the president to govern for the next two and a half years, uh, which is the du remaining duration of the presidential term. So we think that the only way out of uh, this basic sort of disjuncture between uh, the wishes of the people and what the Aragale represented and uh, the regime in power that that can only be resolved. Uh, through a uh, fresh election. Uh, and again, uh, as also Arjuna talked, uh, dis, uh, mentioned the very sort of um, extreme neoliberal reforms that are being pushed by Ranil Vikramasinghe, uh, 
uh, uh, are also areas where, uh, as the opposition, we, we would have to really ensure that uh, those, those reforms are not implemented, basically, because they will, uh, they're, they're posing a huge uh, burden uh, on, on the people who are already heavily uh, under pressure because of the cri economic crisis that is, uh, that is being experienced currently. Thank you. Thank you so much, Heine, and thank you to all our panelists uh, for those excellent uh, presentations. Um, so we have a couple of um, questions. Um, Samita, if you would like to read those out. Yeah, um, I can start with the first question in the queue. Um, so the question says, the government is now apparently considering legislation that would place limits on social media expression. Given the importance of social media in the Aragalaya and the enablement of its use for protest organization by the largely um, neoliberal stance of the social media companies, what circumstances do you foresee in the future of social media in democratic reform in Sri Lanka? Um, who would like to take that question? Arjuna, would you like to start? Okay, I can, I can take it. I think that there is a danger of thinking that repression of this kind requires legislation or fresh legislation. That it has always been the case that these kinds of things will be selected. And that is, for that, the required legislation is enough. I mean, you have things like the PTA and so on that can vote. You have, interestingly, even the ICCPR law, which is used to, uh, uh, for exactly the opposite purpose that it should be designed. So I think, yeah, I'm sure there'll be other kinds of things that come in, but the point is, it will always be implemented selectively. And it has to also appear to be implemented selectively. I think one of the things to understand with this regime is they're not really fussed about appearing to be fascist or appearing to be brutal or appearing to be uh, all of that. I think that's very clear. That's one of the distinctions between Rajapaksa, who did all of that stuff in the war, and the post sort of President Rajapaksa was a bit squeamish, I think, of doing certain kinds of things openly. Vikramasinghe is not, doesn't have any of that squeamishness. And as we see with the police, for example, they're quite happy, in fact, happy to, to the most recent protests. They're quite happy where the, uh, the young socialist group, quite happy to unleash violence that is exorbitant, that is extra, that is beyond what is required and to demonstrate it and show it and present it. That's where the threat lies, you know? And as Harini mentioned, yes, some of them are arrested and they have to be released. But I, I don't think they see that as an issue. It's about you put them through the process. You, you kind of isolate them, you arrest them, then the families get involved. You, you want to create a, 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 a situation of fear. So I think... Uh, I think we, we have a slightly different thing. Yes, there will be the odd bits of legislation that come in or not, but they don't need those things. They will quite blatantly in the face of all of this stuff do it. But what is, I think, important is they have been doing it, not them, the Rajapaksas and so on before, have been doing it with impunity across the board, but because it has been against the Muslims and against the Tamils and against other kinds of dissenters, and the singular majority has has been unaffected, they don't, they see it as something new. And I think particularly with the Rajapaksas, it has always been there. They've invoked, you know, the young man who wrote a book of poems was, was incarcerated for that. So I think, and, and the people who spoke out in, in, in social media in, in that context, in relation to that particular incident and so on, where they invoked the ICCPR and, and also the PTA, as again, they've been taken. So it's it's almost as if the Sinhalese majority is now getting a bit of the medicine that they they were quite happy to see dispensed against their 
uh, their Tamil and and Muslim colleagues. So I think we have to see that in 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 a kind of perspective that for the Aragali and so on to become of age, it needs to recognize that these are part of the kinds of ways of life that that people in the north and the east and even in the plantation experience for years and years and years and years and that has become almost normalized for them. So this, uh, you know, we are seeing violence for the first time, we're seeing you the use of, uh, you know, these kinds of constraints, we're seeing the TID kind of stuff or the surveillance kinds of oppression as if it were new is I think precisely to, to sort of not remove our majority majoritarian lenses and I think that we need to look at so in summary the the regulations that are there are sufficient there will be certain other kinds of things and they'll be withdrawn but the real story is to select an attack thank you Arjuna are there any other panelists who would like to add something Anga Harini Um, just to say that things like the PTA and censorship um, and all of these things have been in existence for many years in Sri Lanka. I mean, the PTA has been around since 1978, the Pre Prevention of Terrorism Act it was supposed to be a temporary act, temporary, it was called temporary provisions. And what we are now, you know, 30 years later, still trying to repeal this. And this current government is talking about bringing uh, of uh, bringing in a, 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 a something called a security act instead. So they're not they're not just going to repeal the PTA; they're going to replace it. And if it's anything that like what uh, was uh, proposed under the, pre the previous Yahapalana government, that was when Ranil Vikramasinghe was. Prime Minister earlier, it's it's actually worse than the proposed PTA. So there's lots of cause for concern. So even yeah, I mean you you know now it's censorship of this of the uh, of social media. But in the past, I mean censorship was was a weapon that was often invoked by successive governments to crush dissent. Uh, so none of this is particularly new. But I think. Uh, you know, but I think that's what's interesting that this moment is allowing us uh, to really look at how the state uh, security apparatus and the sort of sick, uh, military apparatus has, has survived uh, for so long. And then a really serious conversation needs to take place about how we dismantle that. Yeah, and the space given to NGOs. Um you know, was shrunk as well um, under different uh, garments in, um, in place. So um, we have another question. Um, to what extent did China's Belt and Road Initiative, specifically the work on the Port, Colombo, Port of Colombo versus Sri Lanka's debt crisis? Are uh, other nations also part of the Belt and Road Initiative at risk of a similar debt crisis and political fallout? Um, Shanti, would you like to take that? Um, I can answer, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I can probably answer the, the latter part of the question. The, obviously, the, the, as it, the, the port has been described as the vanity project, right? That actually, also led to the demise of the, the, the financial system. But uh, in terms of infrastructure and, and, and useless, I guess, waste of money. money. Uh, but in terms of the secondary uh, question, yes, that, uh, you know, um, the, this particular initiative has been also described as a debt trap, meaning uh, many countries as, uh, have been subjected to these types of development policies from China. And I think Pakistan is one of them. So there, I think CG, um, uh, CGIS has done a fantastic report on this. So I would encourage you to um, review that. And I'm not sure what year it was uh, written, but um, I remember reading about, I think Pakistan, maybe Mongolia, I think Maldives was one of them as well. Um, but again, um, I would have to double check that, thanks. Um, would anybody else like to add to that? Yes, Vasuki. 
Yeah, maybe just to say that, you know, there's been a lot of focus on the Chinese debt, but China, China if I'm uh, if I'm right, I think is around only about 10% of the debt. Yeah. Yeah. Most of yeah. the debt is owned by a whole range of other countries and private corp, uh, companies. So, and uh, yeah. litigation that's happening in New York, for instance, with BlackRock and so on, is yeah. uh, is private lenders. So, you know, you know, there's a lot of xenophobia in the in the med Western media, uh, which has focused on the Chinese debt. But um, it is it is actually the the international system that sustains sovereign debt um, it has predatory lenders of many stripes um, all over. So. Um yeah, I'd like to add to that. Uh, Vasuki is absolutely, absolutely right. Um, the one thing that's troubling about Blackstone is that they have been acquiring majority shares in Sri Lankan companies for years. So that's another sort of, in terms of ownership of shares and things like that, uh, it'll be interesting to see. Um, again, I don't, I don't, I haven't done too much research on that, but that is one of the angles that I think are interesting because that also speaks to the debt crisis. May I add, add something, please? I think it's sure, please go ahead. Yeah, it's interesting where you locate it. Uh, Vasuki is quite right about the xenophobia in certain parts of the West. But in Sri Lanka, it's the opposite. I mean, you find the, the antagonism to the US and to India's involvement, even in the, in the port, is much greater than the, the antagonism to China. So you have, and in fact, it seems to be the arguments about the port and the, the port city and all of that is mainly in the opposition in parliament. Ha Harini can, can correct me if I'm wrong, is about lack of transparency, accountability, all of that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, the governance mechanisms, all of that. I, but I think there are some of us who say, is this the kind of development you want? Is this what will bring you, uh, bring you the kind of prosperity or the equity and so on for, the broader swathe of Sri Lankan society, or will this then do do other kinds of things, which then will benefit a few people, or you know, a certain groups of people, and not the other. So there is, I think, there are two kinds of arguments. The the argument that took center stage in Sri Lanka was about there are not enough checks and balances. The port city thing is uh, is okay, but we need to correct it. We need to look at governance structure. We need to look at who signed the agreements. Is China taking you know that whole thing about taking parts of the land of Sri Lanka, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Whereas there's an entirely other kind of argument which says, is this the kind of thing that we need? Is this what we require? Is this the kind of investment and and development we should pursue? So it's a different kind of argument altogether. That one was not very popular. Yeah, uh, if I may add to that, I did look at the post Port City project from uh, a sustainable development and environmental justice point of view. And uh, it, it's amazing that uh, <laughs> an ocean reclamation project did not even talk about climate change. I mean, sea level rise is a real problem and the environmental impact assessment that was done for this project didn't even mention climate change. It was inconceivable to me. Uh, and of course, not to mention the um, the um, the fact that we sort of enmeshed our future generations in this financial mess, in this debt. So it's not even um, viable economically, let alone environmentally. So yeah, there are lots of um, lots of issues with that project. Uh, but we have three minutes, and I, if I may, I can, uh, if I may, um, ask a question from Ranga about the Aragale itself. Where do you see the Aragale uh, um, in the future, going in the future? Do you think it's going to dissipate or just die, or you know, I mean, because of the backlash from the government? Where do you think it's going? That's a good question. Uh... Sumudu. Um, obviously, the Aragalaya uh, is not there to be seen right now. Um, as I said before, like there was a lot of action on the on the street, and the country had practically come to a standstill. The government offices did not function. Um, nothing basically functioned, and people were just waiting to see what the next step was going to be. Uh, but as some of the panelists said, the situation changed, the direction of the Aragale changed. 
the Ranil Vikramasinghe government very um, uh, in a I, I would use the word cunningly uh, like took control of the situation. They are in they seem to be in control of the situation. Um, so at the surface level, at least you don't see an Aragalaya. It seems like that it's done, it's gone. Uh, but as I said before, as I would always like to believe, some of the changes that the Aragale brought about, um, they are still there in society and they happen to uh, define certain people, like certain approaches uh, in various contexts. So, uh, and as that, that's exactly why I uh, used the famous line from Marx, the revolution is dead, long live the revolution, because I would like to believe that the effects of the revolution are still there, very much alive. And uh, to me, a lot of things are going to be determined by the economic crisis. Um, because now, for the past couple of a few weeks, the situation seemed to be fully under control. The government seemed to be fully in control of the situation. Uh, but now, once again, we are talking about the possibility of very long power cuts. And on the news I heard uh, two days ago that in November, there are going to be power failures, power cuts as long as 10 hours per day. So out of 24 hours, 10 hours, I don't know how we are going to face it. Uh, and right now, it seems like we don't have coal, we don't have money to buy coal. Um, and as a result of which, uh, we are experiencing a slightly longer uh, power cuts. That was what happened today too. It was not expected, but all of a sudden it happened. Uh, so these things, I think, are going to set the tone for what people are going to do in the next few weeks. Uh, and I would like to believe that the, the transformation, that the changes that the Aragale actually effected in the past couple of months, um, they would actually, in the context of this economic crisis and also the, the associated political crisis, um, they will once again start calling shots and people will, um, like there will be, an extension of the people's upheaval, which we saw over the past few months. But so, and as I said before, the, it's the economic crisis that's going to, in my view, that's going to determine a lot of things in the next few months. Right. Thank you so much. So we are out of time. Let me thank our panelists again for their insightful comments, um, and um, you know, let. Um, let's hope that the situation will improve in Sri Lanka because it's really, really sad to see uh, how much people are suffering. And um, yeah, um, there was one question that we didn't get to, I'm sorry, but, um, um, and I would like to thank the Center for South Asia for facilitating this. So thank you so much and have a good day. Thank you very much.